Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the creation of my pain question and answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, The Creation of My Pain. Recorded on the 21st of May 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, well, we have about 40 minutes of Q&A now. Um, the subject of the Q&A, um, are we right to get started? I should ask everyone. Yep. Um, the subject of the Q&A is the creation of my pain, Q&A. So just about the discussion we just had, what, what questions would you like to ask? Do I, do I have to uh, remind you of the... Of these, yeah. Yeah. Um, Chris, can we start with you? Chris, can you leave your hand up. Thank you. Good on you. Um, I got two questions actually. Yeah. First one is: Is it just as unloving to feel inferior and treat yourself bad as it is to feel superior and treat others bad? Yes. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> simple, simple answer. Do you want to know why? Yeah. Well, from God's perspective, everyone is equal. So if you treat yourself as lesser than others, from God's perspective, you're treating yourself in an unequal manner. And if you treat yourself as superior to others, you, from God's perspective, you're treating yourself in an unequal manner. And that's the reason why the pain associated with treating yourself inferior or as superior is often very similar to each other so when you treat yourself badly the pain that comes from treating yourself badly is is usually just as intense as the pain that was going to come from treating other people badly interesting hey because it's the same law being broken yeah. the fact is we are all equal cool. second question all right. How do you tell between acting in an unloving, painful emotion and being pressured or having pain exerted on you by the world for taking a loving action? Well, um, when you act in an unloving emotion or act in a painful emotion, it, it is a choice you are personally making to do so based on that particular emotion. When you act based upon pressure from the world, it's, it's a different cause, a different emotion. That causes you to act. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yep. So, so for example, um, let's say by yourself you choose to treat somebody unlovingly. Well, that has to do with the injury that exists inside of yourself about that particular situation. But if you happen to treat people unlovingly when others are around, but when you're not, when they're not around, you treat them okay. Then that means you have a different emotion causing you to act unlovingly. The emotion is to do with pressure from the world and your desire to accede to or agree with pressure from the world. They're completely different emotions. So they have completely different causes. Even though you might be acting in the same manner. Do you follow? So if I can maybe illustrate a bit better because it, I, I can still feel that confusion about there. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So let's say here I am, I'm a woman and I feel angry with men, All right? That anger comes from within myself and it's to do with my false beliefs about love that I'm engaging that causes me to express that anger towards men generally. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the cause is a emotion within myself of pain that I am suppressing that I feel men have created. Does that make sense? Yeah. Otherwise I wouldn't punish them, right? I wouldn't yeah. attack them. I, I, would, I would feel, uh, I have to, it has to be something that I don't want to feel that causes me to attack them. You follow? Yeah. Now let's say I'm influenced. So let's say I'm only angry with men when another woman is with me. In other words, normally 
I'm not angry with men, but when another woman comes with me, for some reason I start getting angry with men and she starts saying anything about men. I go, yeah, yeah, and off I go as well. And do you see the difference? What am I afraid of now? I'm not just afraid of my own pain with men. You're afraid of the other woman. I'm obviously afraid of that woman somehow because she's instigating and influencing me to attack men. Mm. So it's a completely different emotion. You see? Yeah. Yeah, completely different pain causes that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I kind of meant like if you're in an environment where that's quite bad and you treat someone well, there's yep. a lot of attack for treating someone well. There is. A yep. lot of pressure not to do it. There is a lot of pressure not to do it, but if you still go ahead and do it, that's a very good sign. Yeah. A very good sign that you're developing your will yep. in a positive direction. And that, that would feel different being the person. Well, at the end, you realise that the attack only comes because people are... Like, you're feeling the pain of the attack is what, I'm, is what you're suggesting. Yeah. And, and I'm saying pain of somebody attacking you only comes from issues of self-worth. So in other words, if you felt good about yourself, other people attacking you, you'd ignore. You wouldn't even feel it. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Good. Okay. Uh, if we go to Karen. Okay. I'm a bit confused about the superiority inferiority thing. Mm -hmm. um, when you say that the pain of superiority feels the same as the pain of inferiority. Mm -hmm. When I feel superior, I feel good. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> okay. The feeling of superiority for yourself is the meeting of the addiction. Is a is a an addiction being met? That kind of good is actually caused the destruction of your soul. If you were truly sensitive to it, you would feel really bad about it. So what I'm suggesting is you're completely numb to the sensation of the addiction being met and how bad it is. You follow? What, what I've been doing is saying how, how does it feel the other person feel and I know how that feels is that too long-winded to do that well obviously you don't care about how the other person feels you only care about how you feel the thing that drives superiority is not a care about the other person and how they feel it's a care about how you feel so you need to find the cause which is not related to how the other person feels it's related to how you feel <laughs> do you follow me you're not going to address the cause that way no because you're focusing your attention on the other, how the other person feels rather than feeling how you actually feel and releasing that error. Yeah? So looking <laughs> I can understand why you're confused yeah, so because, for because you're I, focusing on the wrong emotions. Right. So yep. looking for what I feel under the feeling good. Yeah. Why is it you feel good when you feel superior to others? I don't feel good. Why do you feel good? Because it stops me feeling inferior to others, I think. Okay, so, so then start examining why do you feel inferior to others? Right. Okay. Why do you feel bad Like in that regard? See, see, superiority is often the addiction being met, right? The, it, you're getting the addiction met, so you feel great. Yeah. But, but you're not feeling great. You're desensitizing yourself to your soul's own destruction. So that... that uh, that that means that an addiction, a compulsion is being met, mm. right? And it's never good to meet them, no matter how good they seem to feel. It's never good to meet them. It's like it's like a fat person continuing to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, thinking it makes them feel good. What does it make them feel? <laughs> Bad. <laughs> worse. It kills them, in fact, right? So it makes them feel worse. So 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 they are desensitized to how worse they're feeling. So if you, you, the relationship between emotional addictions is very much the same as a, as a relationship in physical addictions. So if you examine a physical addiction like alcoholism or drug abuse or, or overeating, gluttony or whatever, any one of these symptoms, you, you see that the average person believes they engage the action, like the addictive action I'm talking about, 
right? They engage the addictive action and they think that it makes them feel good, but the reality is what? Well, they're, yeah, they're destroying themselves. In the long run, the goodness wears off and then they feel worse. Well, no, no. See, this is what I'm suggesting to you. There's, there's got to be something with the way they see this, isn't there? Something wrong here. Because, because the reality is they're destroying themselves. And if you really knew you were destroying yourself, would you feel good? Of course you would not. So there's got to be something wrong with your assessment of good. You follow? And that's got to come from it masking some other thing that you think is really, really, really bad. <laughs> doesn't it? It's got to come from covering over some type of real huge badness that you believe is going to occur if you don't do it. Now, if you think about a physical addiction, I take a drug, I feel good, my life actually gets worse. I then take some more drugs because it makes me feel good. My life gets worse. I take some more drugs to get feel good, my life gets worse. Eventually, I can even die from this process, right? Or I live in this semi-comatose place for a long, long period of my life doing all these different things that all make me feel worse and yet I don't think they're making me feel worse. There's something wrong with my thinking. Yeah. That's what I've got to find. What causes me to believe that something that's destroying me is actually good? And the way to do that is to feel the compulsion of being superior without being superior. And that will bring me there? Yeah, so here I am, let's say I'm in a situation and I really want to say this thing, you know, put that person down, I really do, you know, and, and I restrain myself from it and instead I feel like, why do I want this so much? Yeah. What is this going to give me that not doing it won't give me? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what, what is this, what is doing this thing going to give me? Mm -hmm. And, and and how bad is that thing? Not good. Bad is that thing that I'm trying to avoid. Yeah. Right. Through the compulsion. So obviously, a person who takes drugs is avoiding quite a lot of things through the compulsion. A person who is engaged in alcoholism, same. The person who's engaged in gluttony, same. It's all to do with avoiding something, right? Yeah. Something that they believe is a bigger pain. I need to find that pain. Thank yep. you. Yeah, so so if you feel good from a feeling of superiority, it's not because you you are sensitive at all. In fact, you've desensitized yourself to what is actually good. You believe something that's bad is actually good. So this is a very much a false belief, an emotional false belief going on. Yeah. We need to correct it. So, so you, you think it's the same process with correcting uh, any addiction physically, so we need to think about the process. Any emotional addiction must require the same process, pretty much same process. All of it to do with avoiding, usually avoiding a, a, a greater pain or something we believe is a greater pain. Yeah. So in your case, whenever it happens, it's the great. It's what's happened in your family when you were treated bad as a child. You're avoiding that pain and and feeling superior through your children. Ironically, frequently that's the way you feel superior, cause or to feel your family is superior, causes you then to act in a certain way that desensitizes you. You're desensitized to the fact that you're actually harming yourself. So forget about. For the moment, you are harming others, I agree, but you focusing on that doesn't address the problem. The problem is that you believe something's good when it's actually bad. That's the problem. And what we need to do is find out why. And, and usually it's because there's a greater pain that we're avoiding through that process. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, we go to, yeah, Judith uh, on this side, thanks. <coughs> Hi. Um, if a person has a physical pain um, and they don't really know why, let's say digestive problems, is it concentrating on the pain when you have it, a way to get to the emotion? No. No. Has it helped you get to yours? No. No. Okay. Well, I try not to concentrate on it, actually, and I try and... <laughs> well, that doesn't help either because <laughs> you need to be aware that it's there. Right. Right. So you need to accept your pain. 
but concentrating on even accepting it doesn't address the issue. Remember that every time, and this is something we need to bear in mind with pain, every time we have a physical pain, so now we're talking about physical pain, which is very, very different than its cause. Physical pain is the result of a whole heap of causes. Right, so we need to start seeing if physical pain begins with the suppression of an emotional pain. Right? So, so if we examine it from a, from a systematic perspective, if you like, we have a physical pain. This physical pain is caused by the denial of an emotional pain. And it's something to do with my definition of love. Has to be out of harmony. Now, digestion related to worth. Right. Therefore, my definition of love related to my own worth must be flawed. Right. Yeah, I know that. Does that make sense? Now, I'm in denial of it. You say you know it. Right. But you can't know it because otherwise you wouldn't have the physical pain. So I intellectually know it, but I don't emotionally Correct. know it. Correct. 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 See, this is a problem with our intellect. We go, I know that, I know that, I know that. And if we knew it, we wouldn't have the pain. The emotional denial of the emotional pain mm -hmm. creates the physical expression of that pain. Right? And, and it doesn't matter how much we go, I know that here in our head, that doesn't eradicate the problem. The only thing that's going to eradicate the problem is actually coming to an awareness of the actual emotional pain. Does that make sense? Right. Now, with some problems, it's really hard because of digestive issues related to worth. Now, those are some of the deepest emotional issues that we have as humanity. So they're going to take, that's going to take a lot of building awareness to access those particular problems. It's not feeling worthless. It's feeling the grief over being worthless. Are feeling worthless? No, now you're guessing. Okay. So I'm saying don't guess. All right, God's willing to tell you what it is. So you don't have to guess. Okay. You just got to be open to God telling you what it is. Right? And the only way to become open to God telling you what it is is to stop being in denial of it. So work on your denial. Your denial of your worth issues. Okay. You've got to work on that. Now this is where I'm doing a lot of work at the moment. Deny the denial of my worth issues. I'm having to work through all the areas that I've been in denial of where I have not been, I have not had a proper sense of my own worth. Does that make sense? Yeah. With women, with men, with different situations and so forth. And, and honestly, it's taken me a lot of effort to, to even just find, oh, there's that, there's that thing going on, you know. There's things that I'm becoming aware of now that... that Honestly, they've been happening all my life, but I've thought of them as normal. And, and now I realise, no, that's not normal at all. Oh. And the more awareness I have of that, the more I have relief. Right? Okay. Don't even have to process things yet so much. You need to first have awareness before you can process something. So, so the physical pain is the result of long-term denial of the emotional pain. We must understand this. And it doesn't matter how much you think you know, you're still in denial of the emotional pain. You need to, right. you need to change the denial of it. Now, all denial of pain is caused by the emotion of terror, fear. So later we'll see that, governing emotion. And, and then you'll, once we go through that, you'll have a bit better idea of how to start getting through this layer of denial, which is all driven by fear. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Yep. If we go, um, what's her name? I can't see you. Sure, that's right. Sorry, sure. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, um, if you've been brought up with beliefs about God um, and which create fear, do you just have to feel the fear? Until it's gone, or uh, there's a couple of things you need to do. Obviously, fear is the uh, result of false beliefs. So, fear is false beliefs appearing true to you. So, in other words, you obviously believe certain things are true about God that are not true. 
That makes sense. So, so how do you address that? Well, firstly, you need to see where it's not true, right? I do in my head. But. Yeah. No. So here is fine. Yeah. But we've got to the work that has to be done is here. We need to see it's not true. So obviously, we still feel it's true. So how do you get rid of a feeling about God that you feel is true? The answer is quite simple. Feeling. Feel it. Yeah. This is where most of us stop. We don't do that. We don't let ourselves do that. We don't feel it. And and this is the beauty of humility. Feeling it lets it go. When you let it go, you go, now I don't feel that anymore. Right? So so what's happened is you've had an intellectual awareness, which is great, that many of the false beliefs that you have emotionally are not true, but yet there's yet to be a willingness to feel them and release them. I have felt a lot of fear. I've, worked, I've felt a lot of fear, but there just seems to be more. So am I just deluding myself? I feel you act in your fear rather than feeling fear. You've got to be careful what is the difference between acting in a fear and feeling a fear. Feeling a fear means you feel the fear and the terror, bodily, physically, usually, without acting. But the majority of people, when they feel a fear, they feel impelled through addiction to act upon it. All right. And this is where we need to do some work if we're going to release false beliefs. Now, the other thing is that many of our false beliefs about God, we realise from our first group, are really about our parents. Mm -hmm. So you can attempt to release false beliefs about God that have nothing to do with God and you won't get anywhere because they're actually about your parents and how they've treated you. And you need to focus on feeling about those. And then you'll get somewhere. Now, many of us are very resistive to feeling the truth about our parents and how they've treated us. And we have a temptation to blame God for how our parents have treated us and to blame God for the beliefs that our parents have created rather than our parents. So this is where we must also do quite a lot of work, disassociating emotionally disassociating the connection between our parents and what we believe God to be. And you have not done that. So if they've if separate the what they've taught you about God to No, I'm saying how they've treated you. Your parents have treated you a certain way that you are not facing as unloving. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of that, you you think God's going to treat you the same way. And that's the false belief emotionally that exists. And you, that's not going to come out until you recognise that your parents treated you that way. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's where there's quite a lot of resistance because you want to believe your mum and dad good. You know, it, Most people want to believe that. And most people want to believe that because that's what mum and dad told us to believe about them, that they're good. And we also, once we become parents, we have a lot high tolerance of our own parents behaviour because we've often engaged with our own children the same behaviour that our parents have engaged with us. And so we have to justify our parents' behaviour because it helps us justify our own behaviour towards our own children. So we have a lot of things tied up in that area and we need to allow ourselves to see more about what's going on there. Remember that most of us have not had a relationship with God yet. So most of our false beliefs about the relationship with God have got nothing to do with God but got everything to do with our relationship that we have had, all of us have had, which is a relationship with family of origin, adults in our childhood life. That's where a lot of our work needs to happen and that's where most of us are avoiding. Thank you. Make sense? Rob on this side, thanks. And then Louise on this side. If you'd leave your hand up, Louise, so that... Yep. Rob. Okay, um, my version of love is basically sin. Yep. So how do Join I navigate How do I navigate giving and receiving love, you know, in the world? Because withholding love is, is um, sin as well. Yep. So wh what, do you do, what do you use to navigate, you know? What, do you, what can I do? <laughs> well, you can see that whatever... Your false beliefs about love must be released, and and what you, you don't and and it's an emotional process. 
yep. that you don't want to engage at the moment. Yep. Now, now your question is driven by the fact you'd like an alternative to that, really. I hadn't thought of that. Does that make sense? <laughs> you, you would really like to have some other way other than having to feel some pain, some other way of addressing these particular problems. You, you, want, uh, you want some other way of being loving without having to feel personal pain. Okay. Now, this is a, a big addiction that the majority of the world has. This is why we often turn to religious ways of life, you know, like, or, or new age ways of life, you know. S s spirituality in many of its forms is all about trying to avoid the personal pain yep. and then using some technique, some, some you know, way of, of gaining some pleasure in life and still feeling like you're doing a good thing. Yep. Yeah. The only real answer, Rob, is to choose to address the pain. Right. Choo choose to feel the pain. Right. And that's the only way that you're going to become more loving. Because while you carry the pain inside of you, you're going to want to justify this carrying of pain by creating false beliefs, by keeping false beliefs. You're also going to want to justify how you act in that pain towards others and yourself. The pain has to come out. And uh, in the end, that's the underlying goal. And we, we talk about that when we talk in the section about releasing pain. Uh, that, that is the underlying goal. Get to the point where we can release pain. Now, what I'm suggesting to you is there's a whole slew of reasons why you don't wish to get to that point. Mm. And we need to firstly understand the facade and understand its and understand the acceptance of it, accepting it, before we'll even get to the deconstruction process and understanding the governing emotions which drive us into avoiding our pain. Right? Now, for the average person on the planet, the avoidance of this is has been created by some very simple mechanisms which we'll identify in the next talk. Okay. Yep. Yep, thank you. Okay. Okay, Louise. Um, AJ, about 15 years ago, this is about my relationship with God. I, yep. I turned away from God. I said, I hate you. I don't want anything to do with you because things weren't working out in the way that I wanted. Can you be more specific about why? Um, when you say things weren't working uh, out the way you wanted. What? I just couldn't find a place. It sounds trivial, but I couldn't find a place to live and um, I felt houseless and homeless. But Yep, so you're triggering a big emotion there. It was a big about, you know, I have to be out in your world sort of thing. So a big emotion being triggered and you blame God for I it. I blame God. And yep. then a few months later my daughter made a suicide attempt. I mean, she didn't kill herself. Yep. But um, I just wonder, because now learning about God and the relationship, you know, it wasn't a strong relationship I had with God, but I believed in God. And then I said, no, I don't want you in my life. Mm -hmm. And then John made a suicide attempt. Is that, could that have been related to somehow? Well, not in the way you think. Like it's not, there's no karmic effect of you making that decision and then she deciding to try to attempt suicide. But, but there is a relationship in that you are very angry and you refuse to feel it. And suicide is all about anger being refused to be felt. Does that make sense? A person who suicides is actually quite angry and they refuse to feel it. They decide that they don't want to feel it. So, so yes, there is a relationship in that regard that you have anger that you were, you know, where you wanted God to do things for you and, and God didn't because um, God won't feed your addictions. But, but you didn't see it like that at the time. And so, so you felt angry and rejecting of God. Uh, but you didn't allow yourself to experience the anger. Right? You were shutting down the experience of anger. You just told yourself that that's it, I'm not having anything to do with God without seeing it as an angry choice. Right? And, and there's a relationship between that anger, the suppression of anger, and your daughter's suicide attempt in that she decides to suppress anger too. Does that make sense? Oh, so she was copying me, mod modelling me. Just modeling. using a different technique, yes. Yeah. She's copying your behaviour. Mm. suppressing she's suppressing her anger and and then feeling very angry as a result and feeling 
like nobody cares, it's related to the similar issue. God doesn't care, God doesn't want me, all these kind of things. God's not going to look after me. And so, and so she feels angry, but she, does, she denies that particular anger. You follow? Mm. So, so the key is not like you getting punished for the anger with God or anything like that. It's that you are angry and you suppress it and you use techniques to suppress it, which you've taught your daughter. You follow? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you need to help, help yourself firstly by connecting to that anger feeling what it was really about and then also help in that process you will automatically help your daughter to connect to her anger rather than feeling she's got to suppress it. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, come down to Ben, down the front. Thanks. Down the front here. Thanks. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, as a child, mm -hmm. after you like really cop it from your, your family of origin and you make a... Yeah, let's be more specific, Ben, um, from mum in particular. Lots of anger and um, just like shut out. Yep, yep. And, um, uh, and you make a choice like withdraw emotionally and you put up a wall. Yep. You, I, and then you choose again to hold on to that mechanism through your life and use it to avoid what you don't like coming from others. Yes. There's the, the amount of problems that have come from that choice as a child, yes. which you hold on to, is just like endless for me. Yes, like, I agree. What do you do with that? Well, it, it, the creation of anything, you've talked about its creation, is it, the, the destruction of anything is about the reverse of its creation, if you like. So, so to, to, to get rid of this choice, you have to see, firstly, you made a choice and you have to feel a, a grieve about why you did so. You follow? So, so you're not letting yourself grieve about why you made the choice. Because when I think about it, it, it just feels like a self-protection. Yeah, but that, that is the avoidance of the grief relating to the choice. Do you follow me? So what, what you're doing, here you are, you've absorbed a lot of behaviour, if you like, from others from family of origin, absorbed a lot of behaviour which has caused you to put a wall around yourself. You made that choice. So you know that that was a choice you made. Yeah, really clearly. Why yeah. did you make that choice? Because at the time you could not feel, you weren't allowed to by your family of origin, and it certainly wouldn't have been safe to, feel the emotion of what has been coming at you. So there's all this stuff coming at you, all this, uh, let's call it attack, shall we, because that's what it is, coming at you, which made you feel a certain way about yourself, which you didn't want to feel. You follow me? So you're avoiding the feeling of the pain. So there was a whole heap of pain created by this attack. And in order to avoid the pain, you chose to not feel the pain, because if you felt the pain, you'd be crying a lot, you probably would have got attacked more. Right? But you're not in that situation now. This is childhood, right? You're, not, you're in a situation now where if you cried, your wife would be happy, right? <laughs> so, so, so it's not like you're in that situation anymore. But you're now... What, so what you've done is you put this wall up towards your pain, right? which also then puts a wall up towards the attack, of course, people's interaction with you. You put that wall up... And that's how you've lived the rest of your life. Now, of course, that is going to cause quite a lot of damage to your life. Yeah, because there's all these relationships that are going to be affected. Your children will be affected. There's all these different things that are going to be affected by that, right? The secret, of course, is to be open to opening that gap up there, isn't it? And feeling what was caused. And is that just um, feeling new pain, being open to, to that now, or is it? Going back to what you were feeling when you were... Yeah, it's not the new pain that you need to feel. The new pain is caused by current actions. It's, it's way, way back the decision being made to avoid the actual real pain that was caused by your family's treatment of you. And the better choice at the time is just keep copping it and feeling that. Because well, you're, you're kind of trapped as a child. You well, no, I feel you made the best choice at the time. Because if you, if you just continued feeling the pain, your parents would have done more and more and more and more things to cause you even more pain. 
they would have taken you to doctors, they would have taken you to psychologists perhaps, they would have beaten you more and verbally abused you more and so forth and so forth. There would have been even more pain. I feel you made the best choice at the time, but you're not making the best choice now. Do you follow? This is, this is a case where we, we often don't realise that when we were children, we made the best choice possible. Right? It's just, it's just not s serving us any more, that choice, because we're in a completely different world yeah, cause and, I, and personal life, you know. Yeah, because I was wondering if I'd just made this huge mistake, which had just wrecked the rest of your life, you know, just yeah, by no, making one choice like that. No, this is a part of accepting the... You, when we talk about accepting the facade, you start to see that many of the choices you made in your facade were probably necessary at the time, right, back in your childhood, but they're not necessary now, right? And particularly, see, in your childhood you had no, there was no God in your life either. When, when you have God in your life, it's completely different too. So for most of us, we had no God in our life, no, no um, like really good experiences in our life, no God in our life, no real love in our life. We got treated badly, so of course you're going to put up a wall. That's your only choice for self-preservation and, and we're masters like the way God's created us is we're masters of self-preservation so so you know we preserved ourselves but but not realizing of course at the time that once you know the family of origin disappeared from our life which to a certain extent yours has um, you then would need to undo what you did you know we, we continue doing it even though we don't need to do it anymore does that make sense? It does, I'd like to listen to that again, but yeah. on the camera as well. Yeah, so, so what you need to understand is that you, in your childhood you made a valid choice. It was the only choice probably available to you, actually, for survival. But now that you're an adult, you're an adult. You can make a different choice, but you don't think you can because you still think of yourself as a child making that choice. So I can just choose to open that up from here on out? You can. That's it? And then go back and feel at the time what was happening? Yes. Now, to do that, you're going to have to feel the reason why you closed it down, which is all to do with the bad treatment that you received. Okay. And feel the bad treatment. Honour the truth of the bad treatment. Honour – the way you honour yourself is by honouring that you were treated badly and that you – this was the only course of action available to you. So that happened at about eight or nine, mm -hmm. and you're still at home. I was still at home till like seventeen. Yep. And it, pe it peters off, but you're still copying it while you've got the wall up. You still need to go into all of that as well. Like, less so like because filter. with the wall up, uh, you know, once the wall's up, there's less pain coming from there's less pain coming from your family because you're not feeling it anymore. But there's more pain associated with your choice now. Yes. Because it's a personal choice. Yeah, so don't go and try and recreate the pain that I'd blocked and try and feel all that. No, you don't need crazy to. Crazy like that. No. no, you don't need to do anything crazy <laughs> like that. All you need to do is open yourself to the actual pain that was caused and open yourself to experiencing it in a childlike fashion. It's all locked up at ages, so you're going to feel quite young as you feel it. You're going to feel, you feel like six, seven, eight, you know. You won't feel like an adult. You'll feel a bit nutter sometimes when you feel it, but that's part of the process. You just need to go through that process. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Paul, thanks. This will have to be our last question, Paul. Um, my question's to do with pain and. Um, uh, um, is it important to know? Um, to do with your uh, sin which you've created, where it comes from if you f start feeling that pain. What pain are we referring to, Paul? Say uh, my kids, uh, um, I just had a, a little bit of time with them and it just became pretty apparent the damage which I've done to them. Yep. And so, so uh, I hadn't heard before when you said God has designed that the pain is different with the harm we do to others compared to the harm that has been done to us. It's like there's a different way to feel that or there's a, it's a different, has a different print. Well, there's different causes. Yeah. So, 
So, and I think at this stage we're getting a bit too complicated because, because you need to see that actually most of this stuff would be quite natural to feel, just like a child. Now, one thing I need to remind all of you is that it is, it is natural for a child to feel, as we'll learn in our next lesson, it's natural for a child to feel pain. It's not an unusual thing. You think about a child learning to walk. Remember I gave that example in the first group. A child learning to walk gets up, falls flat on its face, balls its head off, gets up again. Why does it get up for? Because it's not afraid of pain. It's not afraid of falling over again. Right? And why is it not afraid? Because it released the pain of the last time. Do you follow? The pain of the last time is gone. So it's a natural process to release pain. The child finds it natural learning to walk. So why don't we find it natural as adults? Obviously, there's reasons which we've got to identify as to why we don't find it natural as adults. Once you've identified those reasons and released them, the pain, whatever it is, whether it's caused by you, caused by others, caused by society, caused by parents, caused by your own sin, will naturally appear. It will naturally come up. The key, the work you need to do is removing your blockages to it. That's the work. So we can discuss this pain and that pain and how to access this and that pain, but, but really how to access any pain is by removing the blockages to each pain. That's how to access it. And to, uh, to remove the blockages, we've got to understand what are the cause of the blockages. We've got to understand the blockages themselves. You follow? So I feel, so I feel with regard to your children, for example, and the pain that you've caused there, you need to allow yourself to feel the blockages to feeling that pain, right? Which are all related to choices and decisions that parent, your parents made, society made, and you've made, right? That caused you to act in the manner that you did towards your children. And a lot of it was caused by your treatment of women, in a sense that you allowed women to get away with murder, almost. Pretty, right? much, pretty much. And probably would allow them to get away with murder under certain circumstances um, and and that has caused a, a severe amount of damage now to the way your children see the world and see you and see men and see women and so forth and uh, and those kind of things all need to be deconstructed like you need to look at the this rest of it before you'll know how to access that does that make sense because yep. all of this is on top of it yep all of this all of this stuff here is on top of the pain so sometimes, it, uh, and this is why we've constructed this, uh, this uh, presentation this week in the way we have, is that, is that many of you are trying to access the pain without deconstructing the rest of the stuff that's on top of it. And the problem with that is that you're not going to access the pain because the point of all the stuff on top of it is to suppress it. That's all the point to, is to suppress your pain. And, and unless we deconstruct this, we will not feel this. You follow? Yep. yep. So, so the key for everyone who has any kind of pain in their life, physical, emotional, any type of pain, is to firstly deconstruct what's above it, which is our creation, above it, we need to deconstruct that in order to feel that. Many of us don't want to do that. Many of us want to just get to that and be done with it. <laughs> All right? but, but there's a whole heap of learning in this that needs to happen, you see. We, we need to go through this process because we need to understand how we work, how, how we think, how we feel, how we act, why we act, why, why we do what we do. We need to understand ourselves. We need to understand our unloving self. We need to understand how it got there, where it came from, what choices we made, what decisions we made, and how to deconstruct it. That's what we need to understand. So, so I feel that's what we really need to focus our time and attention on. Yep. Focusing on the time and attention on deconstruction of that. And then we become like a child. And what does a child do? Falls over, cries, gets up, forgets about it. <laughs> gets on with life. That's what we'll do. We'll, we'll feel the pain, feel the old pain, just come up naturally, bang, it will be gone. 
and on with life we go feeling happier thank you yeah so so don't get too tied up in this what pain this and what pain that and what do i have to feel here yet because the reality is if you're not don't already know it's because of this if you're not already feeling it it's because of this this is what we need to focus our attention on you follow yeah good eh? all right well um that uh i think we'll have to do for our q a on the creation of my pain now just to examine my uh outlines 210 we're due to go oh that means i'm actually two minutes ahead <laughs> you can ask one more question if you like <laughs> just trying to work it out eva thank you if we go to eva Um, I have a question about self-responsibility. Yes. And how it relates to... Um, oh, I wrote it down. Um, yeah. Self-reliance or God-reliance. For me, it feels like, you know, it should be self-reliant to be self-responsible. No, it's no. not. Uh, very different. Yeah, so good question. Very different. So let's look at one. There's, so there's self-reliance. Now in this state, what do we normally believe? We normally believe that uh, we're by ourselves. In other words, we live by ourselves. We're responsible. No one will help us. There's another belief of self-reliance, isn't it? What other beliefs do we have in self-reliance that you can think of? It, for me, it would be like, I know everything. Could I? Yeah, I know everything. I have to fix everything and I will do it. Survive. Sorry, survive? Survival. Survival. Um, yeah, man, yeah, you could say, I suppose I, I must survive. There's many beliefs here anyway. Most of them are, can you see that most of them are certainly out of harmony with God's truth? Can you see that? Yeah. Most of those beliefs are out of harmony with God's truth. Well, let's look at self-responsible now. All right. Now, self-responsible person says, I um, oh, let's put it, only I can feel my feelings is one thing a self-responsible person does. Does that make sense? Now, can you see that is in harmony with God's truth? Can you see yes. self-reliance has a lot of beliefs associated with it that are out of harmony with God's truth? Yeah. And when we start to list the beliefs of self-responsibility, they are you'll find that every single one of them is in harmony with God's truth. I, only I, can choose how to exercise my will. Another truth is it not um how would you then could you write the like the i must survive and make it into a self-responsible statement <laughs> and please say it loud i can't see what you write i live forever <laughs> wow yeah isn't that true yes now a self-responsible being goes i live forever i am responsible for all my choices forever yeah a self-reliant person says i've got to survive i'm not responsible for my choice to harm you because i have to survive i'm not responsible for my choice to kill you because if you're going to take from me what i need to survive i, I i'm justified killing you that's what a self-reliant person does a self-responsible person says, I live forever, I don't need to kill you. 
to survive. <laughs> Even if you're going to kill me, I don't need to kill you to survive because I live forever. A self-responsible person has a whole set of beliefs that are in harmony with God's truth. A self-reliant person has a whole heap of beliefs that are out of harmony with God's truth. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. So the way you can tell whether a belief is associated with reliance, self-reliance or self-responsibility is by examining whether it's God's truth or not. Yes. Mm. Interesting, huh? Yes. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. These are, these are the kind of things, you know, that um, they come to you automatically once you work through certain emotions, Eva, you know, once you work through certain things. See, you think about this, a lot of this is driven by fears, isn't it? You can see, like, the fear of survival, the fear of not knowing everything, of not understanding, the fear that, you know, you, you've got to look after yourself because no one else cares about you. They're all fears. Right? Yeah, I, I can feel that self-reliant is kind of uh, tense. It's like yeah, because it's driven by fear. Yeah. The whole thing is driven by fear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas a self-responsible person is not driven by fear. He's driven by love. Love of self, love of others. You see, if I if I'm responsible even for my own food, I won't make you cook for me unless you want to cook for me. I won't make you cook for me. And I certainly wouldn't put up with you cooking for me every day. You follow? Yeah. Because a self-responsible person wouldn't do that. Mm. Interesting, hey? We could actually add hundreds of things to this list, which would all be God's truth, and hundreds of things to this list would, would all be fears, justifying these oh. particular actions. Yeah. Very, very different, aren't they? Very different when you analyse self-responsibility, self-reliance. Good question. Mm. Thanks. All right. Okay, well, let's have our half an hour break. I've now gone five minutes over. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should have stopped before. Um, so let's get us back at uh, quarter past uh, two. Quarter past two.